we tie inspiration to feeling. We say stuff like, I don't feel inspired. I don't think inspiration is a feeling. That's why we can have quotes like, inspiration will find you working. Because sometimes you have to start working to feel inspired. I've been making one image a day of found nature every day for 12 years. I mean, it's, cra it's crazy, mm. kind of. Two voices to uh, start the show this week. The first was Sean Tucker, the philosophical YouTuber who later on is answering a question that you have sent into this show about the thing that we do, this thing that we do, making pictures, photographing, putting our art out into the world. It's a question today based around finding time, finding energy, I suppose, which I'm sure at times is something we've uh, probably all felt we just don't have enough of to some degree. And then Mary Jo Hoffman, inspired by a photographer, an artist, a sculptor called Carl Blossfeld, who sounds like a Bond villain, doesn't he? Ah, Mr. Blossfeld. Put that cat down. You'll get hair all over your lap. Anyway, he inspired, did Carl, uh, my guest, Mary Jo, for, uh, who for 12 years has been on the most wonderful and simple nature hunt with, uh, well, I suppose a satchel to collect stuff and, uh, and a camera, uh, which has resulted in finding a, a mindful daily practice in her life, which has further resulted in a book about the art of noticing, simply called Still. And uh, I've greatly simplified Mary Jo's life a little there, <laughs> which, uh, Mary Jo, I do apologise, but the full story is to come. Look at this, a tree has fallen across the path. Now this path, oh, hang on. Now this path is uh, one that I regularly take in the winter. It's a great place to come for my photo walks because it's, uh, it's slightly sheltered away from the rain uh, of most days, it seems, of an English winter anyway this year. Uh, but also it's a, it's a great place because not many people come here. So I can wander up and down this path, photographing, talking into this microphone, <laughs> recording my thoughts. And uh, I generally find myself sort of, if not lost in nature, but alone in nature, just soaking in the spirit of, of nature without a thousand and one people cycling past me. Now, two decades ago, a friend of mine started up an agency called uh, Why Not? And uh, I actually made all their initial publicity portraits. It was a fantastic PR company that was always asking, well, why can't we do it that way? Why not? Who's to say it has to be done that way? Why not do it the way the professionals say it shouldn't be done? And my guest, Mary Jo Hoffman, embraced that simple notion, really, of asking, why not, when it came to art and photography? And I'm delighted to have met Mary Jo for several reasons. There's a, there's a list, actually. So, uh, Mary Jo, you may want to hide behind this imaginary sofa I figuratively lug behind me each week as I walk here on the episodes, the one I, I hide behind if somebody should heap compliments and praise during the letters we read out in the show itself. One, reason one, I'm, uh, I'm happy we met because we don't talk about nature photography enough on this show, surprisingly. Two, I think being immersed or surrounded by or however you want to describe it, by nature, is the simplest form of mindfulness that's free of charge. You don't have to pay to learn how to be in it, or indeed be inspired by it. You don't need an expensive mat of any sorts. You don't have to feel you don't understand it because you only have to find wonder in it. What was that quote from last week? Don't try to understand it, just accept it. I think that would apply to this week as well. Third reason for meeting, for enjoying meeting Mary Jo today. I love the simplicity of this daily practice we're about to talk about, that you can find something, bring it home, photograph it, then publish it, without this need to find followers or likes or any other form of validation. I'm pretty sure we have had reasons four, five, six, seven and eight tied up with what I've just said to you. Look, suffice to say, I think you'll enjoy meeting Mary Jo Hoffman because she has an enthusiasm for just doing. And it's a just doing that's resulted in her first book through Fiden. Not a bad publishing house for your first major book release. And um, I will add this. Mary Jo has made this life of observation a thing in her life that has 
I think, fueled her spirit for nature and making photographic art in spite of the, well, well-meaning people, I'm sure, who mooted, you can't do that. There are rules and stuff, Mary Jo. You just can't do that. Because when they said you can't do it that way, she just replied, well... Why not? Today on the photo walk. I have this dog that needs to be walked every day. I have two kids. The whole family likes nature. I will walk the dog every day, find something in nature to photograph. I showed some professional photographer friends of mine, some um, very good ones. And they said, oh, you can't float your images on a white background. You need a frame. You need a frame. And I was like, but I I don't want a frame because when you're in the blog, I want it to be a seamless scroll. If I was going to do it every day, it had to be low tech and it had to be portable and it had to be easy. I don't want to stop. This is such a beautiful way of living in the world. Commit to doing something daily. I call it radical incrementalism. Mary Jo Hoffman sharing thoughts about being out in nature and making work and finding mindful retreat. And before I give you a flavour of today's mailbag, thank you to our Extra Milers and MPB who sponsor this show and keep us here week on week. As a website, mpb.com is where you can safely buy, sell and trade quality used photo and video gear online and be a part of the circular economy. It's a service I use. I've been very happy with them for many, many years. I've bought, I've sold, I've traded all on that platform. Right now, as camera bodies are currently in high demand, MPB has increased the amount you can get paid for your camera. Now, here's how it works. You go online to mpb.com. You click the button at the top of the website that says Start Selling and Trading. And then you just follow the very easy instructions where you're prompted to enter the model name and click a box for the appropriate condition. From there, your kit is collected from your front door and then MPB pays you for your camera gear within days. And here's a bonus. If your gear is in better condition than expected, they will just automatically increase the amount you get paid. MPB's price commitment provides the right price up front and they provide instant quotes that are guaranteed for 14 days. Plus, they never add those hidden fees. I'll have a link on the show page today or simply remember these three letters, MPB and then stick on the end.com. On the show today then, well, I'm delighted to share an ongoing story of Can Do, making pictures in spite of the physical hurdles that have been thrown before this particular writer. We haven't had a Mally's tree story for ages, have we? So let's put that right today with a lone tree, a lone tree somewhere in America land. And from Norway, a letter that kind of, well, touches on why you should never feel you haven't got a story to write in with or about. Plus, it being the fourth Friday of the month, the philosophical YouTuber Sean Tucker is here to answer a question that you've sent in from the mailbag. Right, shall we walk? Checklist out. Coffee, check. Garibaldi's, check. Map for your van. I'm saying this at the moment because I know Mally's listening. Have you got a map, Mally? Good, check. Walking shoes, check. And a small box to take home some things to make still life shots from. Check. Let's walk. For the uh, the pictures today that I usually make, uh, well, I've replaced them. I brought my camera, but uh, I'm not going to use it. It's a photo walk, Neil. Yes, I know, but I'm I'm going to use it for very different reasons. My uh, my sketchbooks or my sketchbook pictures that I usually make whilst I'm out on the walk, I'm replacing that with, um, well, inspired by the, the letter about to come and the work of Mary Jo, I'm collecting some bits today to try and do some still life when I get back. I've, um, no, <laughs> I've no idea how I'm going to photograph them. I suspect I'm going to be very much led by uh, the way Mary Jo does it. Perhaps find a twist of my own. Um, but I'm collecting bits that I find as I walk along the path this morning. And, um, well, schoolboy error number one, I've got my box, but I forgot to bring my snips. So actually, or does Mary Jo, I'm not sure that, um, oh, look at that. There's a photograph. The ivy, just 
part of it glistening because we had overnight rain and uh, the sunshine is just just dappling through this tree to my left and kissing the ivy to my right across the path there's just a small amount of it lit up it's like somebody's brought a a small spotlight oh fantastic but i'm going to collect stuff put my put my notes down here's my box and uh, what i'm going to do is just collect some bits that i find along the path i so I haven't brought snips. Does Mary Jo use snips? Does she snip and take things away from nature? Or is it just that she, what she finds along the path? I suspect it's the second, isn't it? It's the latter. Although there is a picture of some snips, of her with some snips, and one of her publicity photographs. That, I would imagine, is what she uses when she's at home. Now, I brought a, <laughs> a small box. It's not a very large box. I'm not sure how much I can collect, but uh, first item... And there's some, just an interesting, it's like an S shape. Some wood, just a bit of wood that I I found on the path here. It's fallen from a tree. Right. First collected item. I haven't been on a treasure hunt, probably since my youth. We, uh, we always start with the mailbag. And remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about a, a few exhibitions. Uh, two of our illustrious community have been involved in. Well, one of those names was Hannah Gimblet, who's been a good friend of the show since the day it launched. And I, I think that's probably, well, what, three years, four years since this show's been around? I don't know. Who's counting? 426 episodes. Who's counting? I think this letter, Hannah, your letter, fits so well into today's show for the mindfulness nature that it's, uh, or the nature of mindfulness that it brings. Uh, whether you are, well, in it, immersed in it, walking in it, or in Hannah's case, uh, where it's brought into your world to enjoy because you otherwise can't retreat into it. Hannah, for health reasons, has for a long time now not been able to venture out to photograph and for much of that time uh, completely bedridden but with the support of um, of her family and mum in particular has been able to make these exquisite pictures about and of nature in in and from her bedroom bringing nature into her space so i was delighted to receive this which i think will fit well with some of the thoughts you'll hear mary jo share in terms of making pictures into um, a process that well a simpler process that you can enjoy once you're back at home which fits with this letter hello neil it's been a little while since I've written into the photo walk, though, of course, without fail, I look forward to tuning into the show every week. My, uh, my health has been and unfortunately continues to be an uphill struggle, to say the least. Nonetheless, I'm continuing to hold on to my creativity as much as I can. Despite all the challenges I'm pushing through at present, I'm thrilled to have been pursuing some new work recently for a wonderful exhibition called Silver and Light. It's a true collaboration of film photographers, and I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be involved. Now, this is one of the the projects that we mentioned a few weeks ago. So really, now we're getting a, a further insight into it. The exhibition curator, says Hannah, Katie Louise Cooper, was looking for photographers to be part of an upcoming exhibition a few months back, so I messaged her on Instagram, and I honestly didn't expect to be considered due to the seed of doubts uh, we can have about ourselves and our work. Thankfully, I was wrong, and I'm so glad that I pressed send on that message despite the niggling doubt in my mind. This exhibition that I'm now involved in has brought so much to me, especially as I haven't been able to pursue my passion as much as I like to recently due to everything that, that's been going on. Also, to be completely confined to bed for nearing on five years now certainly brings with it many hurdles and restrictions in terms of even picking up a camera and trying to get a spark of inspiration as to new and interesting perspectives to capture. Working on this and having a positive focus to engage with has been truly wonderful. I've recently had my beloved Yashika Matt TLR fixed. Oh, what a fantastic looking camera. That's, uh, (laughs) I know it's the person behind the camera, but oh, look at this. It's fantastic. 
Um, I've had it fixed and adapted with an eye-level prism. It's been a fair few years since I've used this great camera, so I must admit uh, I was a tad rusty with it, but I'm getting back into the swing of it now. I managed to capture some images I'm pleased with for silver and light with my adapted bedside photo set up and, of course, the essential help of my dear mum as well as my brother. Both photos are taken with my Lomography film as I love the vibrancy of the 400 and 800 film stocks, especially when it comes to botanical subjects. I had a, a local Devon flower grower deliver some gorgeous flowers, which was a joy to capture, especially as they happened to be ones that I hadn't photographed before, uh, specifically the, I hope I get this right, uh, Alstromeria. Is it Alstromeria? I'm sure it is. And Pussy Willow. I've uh, realised more than ever how much I need photography in my life. The involvement in this exhibition has proved this more than ever. It's a truly amazing outlet that I'm blessed to have. Um, it's a shame not to be able to visit Camwood Gallery, where the exhibition is, to see my work on display, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity and what it's enabled me to do. For the prints, I'm working with the master specialist printer, Mike Crawford of Lighthouse Darkroom. I've never come across more detailed and beautiful prints. I'll also have postcards for sale at the gallery, too, with a favourite film photo of mine. Overall, this has been such a true boost of positivity during the most difficult of times. Apologies for the lengthy mail, Neil. Never apologise for lengthy letters. I was very keen to share this all with you. Thank you for the continued inspirational conversations on the photo walk. I've discovered many brilliant creatives thanks to this glorious podcast. Very best wishes, Hannah Gimblet. Hannah, thank you so much for the letter. Thank you for your support of this show. Um, oh, hang on. <laughs> Cross the path there. Otherwise, I've got a shoe full of water. Um, I have a thought. Oh, <laughs> stand by. Neil has a thought. Yes, I do have a thought. And it's this, that seed of doubt that you mentioned during your letter, which is an apt word, seed, that is, when we're talking about nature, obviously. Let's replace, though, the word doubt in the same sentence with idea. Let's make that a seed of an idea. You seem to me to be an ideas merchant as my father used to call it. Because perhaps, perhaps, after listening to today's show, maybe there's a further work of yours to be explored in the way of a book in the, the months and the years to come. Because your nature work in a book, with your thoughts, perhaps a sort of diary or recounting your story of how photography has seen you through these, or sees you through these hard times, I think it could be such a strong piece of work. I really do. I honestly, honestly do, Hannah. Um, we'll put it into the, <laughs> the why not pile, shall we? I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas of your own too. So, uh, so thank you for this. And the pictures you're showing will be on the show page today. I'll also pop up some links to the fantastic Lighthouse Darkroom. And I'll include a film on the show page that shows you this wonderful TLR camera made by somebody who I very much want to interview. I've been in touch with him actually for oh, over a year now. And we've never quite met. His name is uh, Carl McDougall. He comes from Canada, but he lives quite close to me, Reading Way in uh, South England land-ish. And I'll also actually, I'll pop up um, a film that he made photographing old British petrol stations on expired 4x5 film. It's a YouTube film that he, he made because it's just another great example of making pictures and stories of the ordinary and gifting them a, a little bit of the extraordinary. I've uh, come out especially early this morning to, to record because uh, the, uh, the weather is closing in, as the professionals say. But uh, the sunlight at the moment, beautiful. It really is. I'm looking for some ivy that may have... It won't fall on the floor, will it? It's fairly... It's sturdy stuff, ivy. They all stick together like a clan, don't they? Not going anywhere. Certainly not falling on the floor. Oh, not me. But I do love the texture of ivy. I really do. I love the shape of it. Um, and there's plenty of it around here, but just none of it on the floor. Anyway, I need a bit of help, please. I know you do, Neil. 
it's blatantly obvious. It uh, really helps the show to be discovered if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I've seen a few of late. Thank you so much for doing that, and, and especially for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Uh, to do it, go to the Apple Podcasts app, search up the photo walk, and then leave just a few words as a review. That way, the great podcast sphere recognises us more and suggests us to more people who might like to walk with us and become part of this community. If you're on Apple uh, at the moment using the app, easy peasy, lemon, you know the rest. Right, prior to the first part of my conversation with Mary Jo Hoffman today, last chance to take part in the assignment for March, as next week there's going to be a new one set by my, uh, by my guest of the week, actually, Stephen Wilkes, the American photographer, who was an absolute joy to talk with. He has stories of Ellis Island that will make your hair stand on end, and you know me... <laughs> I am challenged in the full head of hair stakes, and even my hairs stood on end. They started to grow during our chat, so they could just stand on end. And he'll be talking about his amazing day and night project. I have Lars Hegard and Mike Miller to thank for my initial um, introduction, or, or rather reminding me, because I... I knew Stephen's work, I'd seen it, I'd seen it so many times, but uh, to be introduced, reintroduced to it by, uh, by Lars and Mike um, was fantastic and has resulted in a, a conversation I'm so, so pleased to have had and privileged to have had. So he has next month's assignment and um, then one of our extra milers, Simon Blakesley, has a super one after that I recorded just a few days ago, so we're, we're good to go on assignments for the next few months, that's for sure. In the meantime, one more week to take part in this one. The Photo Walk Assignment. This year, our assignments have taken on a different form. They are one-word assignments. So we'll give you a word, interpret that word, and then take it out and make a photograph. Christopher, I think you're very well placed to, uh, to, to set a one-word assignment for this month. Uh, what will that word be? Um... I've chose the word overlooked. Ah, I like it. And yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, just to give a little explanation. I mean, I think there's so many times that as photographers, we either go out on an assignment or we go looking for photographs and we have, we want to have some ideas. We want to have done some homework. We have some preconceived notions of what we're going to photograph. Yeah. You know, we go out and there's things that we would just never photograph. And those are kind of the things that just become overlooked and they, for various reasons. To try and find value and meaning out of some of these objects or people, I think is, for me, has been an incredible experience as a photographer. And it not only, you know, challenges your creative ability in terms of making these overlooked items exciting, but it also, there's a storytelling aspect about it. Um, you know, it's sort of these unsung heroes, these underdogs, whether it's a person, whether it's an object, whether it's a place, yeah. Overlooked. I like it. Okay. There are some super pictures coming in which are on the March assignments page, so good luck. I look forward to seeing your photograph about the overlooked. So, I feel I've introduced you to Mary Jo Hoffman already, so I'll launch pretty much straight into our conversation. I adore this, this story, really, for the, the purity of intent. And um, whilst all our lives are texturally different especially when it comes to the relocation part of Mary Jo's story that, uh, that you'll hear about. I think the, the idea of bringing something so simple into our lives uh, creatively is a tonic to the soul. I do, I know, a bit poetic, but I do mean it. Or ears, I suppose, in our case. I, um, I love the idea of simplicity being the, the ultimate form of sophistication because, as you will see on the show page today, where I've linked to Mary Jo's work and included some favourites of mine um, as pictures on the page, there, there's a great deal of sophistication to her work. I can see it hanging. I can easily in galleries, large formats, and I celebrate this concept of, uh, of serendipity, of finding the great when you weren't necessarily seeking it. Here's my conversation with Mary Jo Hoffman, part one. Mary Jo, I do want to move swiftly on to the change of life story because that's what this is all about. But this feral childhood that's noted <laughs> in your bio, 
I can't pass that by because I think often it can bring about those very first and, and very important introductions to to childlike wonder. And I I was wondering if this uh, was that for you because what you're doing now and what you were finding in the world as a child. I mean, am I am I am I trying to make a connection that doesn't? No, exist? you're you're one. You're 100 percent right. Absolutely. Yeah, I grew up in the. Let's see. I was born in 64. So I grew up in the 70s. And back then, and I'm sure it was the same in the UK. I'm sure it was. It was, you know, my husband's a writer and he's got a a memoir coming out. And he referred to my parents' parenting as benign neglect. And (laughs) my mom read the early draft of his book. And she said, I didn't neglect you. And I said, Mom, you never, you never saw a report card. You never knew where I was. You didn't know my friends. Yeah, I left the house in the morning. I came home for dinner and then I went back out after dinner until dark. Like, I, I'm not saying you were a bad mom. I'm just saying you weren't involved. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we ran wild. Uh-huh. We ran wild as kids. I grew up in the in the suburbs then, and my parents had been. My dad's a first generation Romanian immigrant, and they lived in the in the city of St. Paul, where all the immigrants first arrive. And then as they became more affluent, you move out into the suburbs, and so we were in. A new development where, you know, just beyond the street, it was still all undeveloped Mm. woods. And so we just left the house in the morning and didn't come home until evening. Yeah, I spent my entire childhood outside, literally in the woods and and playing, building forts. We'd swim. There's a lot of lakes in Minnesota. We'd ice skate in the winter, you know, until our feet were numb. And then we'd go home and cry because they, you know, they would start to tingle and hurt as they came back, as they warmed back up, you know. So I just, we just ran wild. And I think everybody did back then. Mm. And I spent my time in the woods. And absolutely, you're the first to perceive that and ask that about that childhood wonder. I loved spending time in the woods. Uh, for fear of sounding like um, two, two children of the 70s saying, it's different these days than when we grew up. I do think there is a difference to to how childlike wonder is now experienced. I, I really do. Absolutely. I do too. I do too. And I, I would have uh, given anything for my children had half of that growing up. Mm. We live in a, a fairly safe a- area. We have, we live on three acres on a lake. What, ha- when did stranger danger, you know, is that the eighties when that arrived? Ever since then, we don't let kids roam, you know, a development of your own core and your own identity and your own likes and dislikes. Cause there was no adults, um, telling you what you should like or dislike and and it just i think it was i think it was a super tremendous way to grow up and it led to um i I don't know a self-confidence and a and a night you know just a a solid core is all i can say i i like a left turn at the traffic light story particularly when it's a life-changing story to do with the arts and yours is (laughs) but to get to where the lights illuminate the filter lane I'd like to understand your previous career and life. Now, you were an aerospace engineer until photography and mm-hmm. art came and stole your heart. It was, is, this a, is this a looking for the ladder to escape over the wall story? Or were you as surprised as any Not of your colleagues yeah. were that you, you changed direction? So I'll tell you what happened. So th- I was, you know, running wild as a kid. Parents weren't paying attention. I can honestly say I didn't really know that I had a superpower in mathematics. <laughs> who knew? Got to, who knew? Who knew? Honestly. Anyway, I, I said to my mom once, I very distinctly remember saying, because it was, I had a good report card. And I said, Mom, you want to see my report card? And she said, No, if the school's not calling, you're not in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the idea. So um, I get to, I get to university. And um, I had one teacher in high school who said, consider engineering. It's a difficult school to get into, but it's easy to go from there to any other colleges in the in the university if you decide to change. I said, okay. So I applied to univer- I applied to engineering, got accepted. Nobody knows where it came from. My parents don't, you know, they don't consider themselves good at mathematics. But I was so good. I got a scholarship to go to Stanford for a graduate degree in aeronautics and astronautics. And then worked in research, aerospace research for 17 years. I loved it. I love my colleagues. I loved where I love. And I to this day, I miss being part of a, like a 
small, high functioning team, team yeah. Of, yeah. of people that you really respect. Yeah. I miss that. You know, creative work is so solitary. I think creatives do struggle a bit with that. I do. Oh, I do. I absolutely do. The solitude do. of it. Right. I consider myself, I, 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 I would imagine you're an extrovert, Neil. I don't know. Are you? I don't know. You can be an introvert, I, um, extrovert, can't you? I've just yeah, I'm an learn, ambivert. Yeah. It's called an ambivert. An yeah. ambivert, yeah. So, yeah, I'm an ambivert pushing towards extrovert. And yeah. um, I got I got a taste of that being part of a high functioning team recently when I des- when we designed and published this book mm. with Monicelli Fiden. So I've got a book coming out in May. Yep. You know, the book process takes depending on who you're working with and what you're trying to do. It takes about 18 months. And, you know, I had an editor and I had a designer and the three of it was the three of us for about a year. But it, for me, I loved being part of a team like that again, where everybody brings their unique focus mm. to the project. Mm. And you, you, there's mutual respect all around. And the whole thing gets better because of everybody's unique perspective. I just loved it. I was reminded of how much I missed it when I did this book um, yeah. recently. So, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about the book in, in a while. Your daily practice where you began photographing one thing in nature each day, was this a mindfulness activity at first? I think I stumbled onto something by happenstance that I'm, I think is very valuable and other people can for sure be inspired by, but maybe even, you know, get specific ideas for their practices from, but I'll go back to the aerospace engineer. I quit in my forties. So I did that for 20 years and I quit my forties because my husband and I were, we waited a little long to start our family and had some infertility issues. So we switched roles. I'd been the primary breadwinner and he had been the stay at home dad and we switched roles. And then I, and then was successful. We had two kids and I was heads down with littles for a bit. And then when they went off to school, I said, uh, I'd always had ambitions. You know, I went into engineering because I was good at math, not because I had a calling for engineering. And so when they went off to school, I said, I've always wanted to be a visual artist and my husband always wanted to be a writer. We, you know, I said, okay, I've got a few hours a day to to do something. And what happened is we had put our kids into a French immersion public school, but it's French immersion. So it's taught in French. Okay. So in order for the kids to cement their French learning, we went and rented a house in Southern France um, for half a year, put them in school for a semester um, in a village school in Southern France. And it was the first time we had like um, extracted ourselves from the busyness of those middle, I call them the messy middle years. <laughs> you know, when you've got career and children and they're just messy, right? Mm-hmm. They're messy, busy years. And we extracted ourselves from ours, our social life, our you know business demands. And we said, let's practice for retirement. So my husband started writing and then I started this one a day photo practice. You know, it was the time when blogs were big and those one a day challenges were big yeah. and and people seemed to be having fun. I wasn't on social media. I didn't know what a blog was, but I stumbled on all that because I had leisure time and they look everyone looked to be having fun. They were supportive. It was a community. They complement each other and it just looked fun. And I thought I want to seat at that table. Yeah. So I devised a one a day project that I would make a photo a day. I'd been an amateur photographer ever since college. I had a roommate who was an artist and she introduced me to photography at university. And now I'm in my forties and I said, well, I have this dog that needs to be walked every day. I have two kids. The whole family likes nature. I will walk the dog every day, find something in nature to photograph. Yeah. And I'll share that on a blog, <laughs> which I had to Google what is a blog, literally. <laughs> but um, what happened is I, I chose to photograph it in this very stylized way on a pure white background. Like I didn't, I, I was naive and I feel like the naivete was to my benefit. That <laughs> that beautiful naivety is how many creative, successful creative things start before yeah. you learn the rules. I before mean, I learned the rules, yeah. I had no rules yeah. and I was alone in France Later, like a year later after I had started the project, I showed some professional photographer friends of mine, some um, very good ones. And they said, oh, you can't float your images on a white background. You need a frame. You need a frame. And I was like, 
but I, I don't want to frame because when you're in the blog, I want it to be a seamless scroll. So then, and then I showed a friend who works for a well-known um, photo workshop organization in the United States. And she said, oh, your, your work will never be considered art because it, you have a white background. That's commercial photography. So you're just doing commercial photography. And I was like, I don't care. Like, I'm just making photos I like. Yeah. Like, you guys, why all these rules, guys? Why yeah. frames? And I can't use white backgrounds. And I'm just making something I like. The idea was you were picking up stuff in nature. You were putting yeah. it on a white background on a flat lay and photographing it. Yeah, and flat yeah. lay. And on my kitchen floor, which I still photograph, it's 12 years and I haven't stopped. And I haven't no. missed a day. No. So this is, there's some craziness here, but not really when I explain how it became this, like a mindfulness practice. But yeah, I've tried to have studios. I've tried, you know, putting a studio in the spare bedroom. I've tried a studio in every place in the best light I've ever found is in my, under my kitchen windows. <laughs> so that's where I make my photos on the kitchen floor on either white paper, or, or, you know, bright white yeah. or black. Or you go black, on white or yeah. black. Uh, so I'm interested to know whether you think of this as a photographic project or whether you're an artist, a blogger, and, and, and why the, the photographic thing really, really became your, I suppose, your vehicle for this. So I started the practice in order to teach myself composition. Ah, okay. I want to play with elements of composition. And I happen to be in a natural setting with nature. I happen to be one. And there's a lot of us out there. And that is part of the reason the project caught on, who pick up beach rocks, who pick up you know, feathers when you find them. Yeah. So I used nature, but ca the camera for me was just the instrument that I captured my arrangements with. Yeah. You know, I could have, I could have painted them in watercolor. I could have, you know what I mean? Yeah. I could have sketched them once I made them. I just happened to be a pretty good amateur photographer. So I used the camera. Uh, and I know that whether it's, uh, regardless of whether it's the white background that you're using to lay your objects on or, or the, or the black background, that it's all available light, isn't it? And that I think that's that's where I love this, this the simplicity of what you've found. And then we're still going to talk about it, turned into a book. Yeah. yeah. Because here's the here's the deal. If it was gonna if I was gonna do it every day, it had to be low tech and it had to be portable and it had to be easy. It, it was very, very, if I knew if I was going to do it every day, including weekends we went out of town, mm. trips to France, whatever, it was going to have to be a very simple setup. So to this day, my process is very simple. Matter of fact, professional photographers often get a little bit anxious or wiggly when they see my process. It's well, <laughs> well I, I think it's actually very, I find it heartening. And I, I've been a professional photographer for 20 years. And I like simplicity. Yeah. When I started the project, I didn't even have a tripod. A couple of years in, I bought a tripod. Images got immediately better with a joystick so I could, you know, shoot at 90 degrees. I mean, images got immediately sharper. For me, if, I, if I'm spending any time wrestling with equipment, I'm missing the point. Mm. You know, for me, it's about the art of seeing, the art of noticing when I'm picking my subjects to photograph and then the art of composition. The photography for me is to the capture and is the, is the shortest. It takes me minutes to capture the image. And I just set an F22 and, and a plus one or plus one and a half, plus two, depending on the subject. We're familiar on this show and in the UK, maybe you are too, with Paul Sanders and his uh, beautiful Discover Still project which has been a part of his life for, for many many years and it was a directional change in his life and quite a sharp one mentally coming out of working in newspapers and actually being at a point of his life um, where he was um, suicidal we've we've run uh, a particular episode on that where I walked in the woods and we had a long conversation a very honest conversation about that um, I would imagine, as he has found, I would imagine many people have messaged you about finding their own still, haven't they? Yeah. So I started this project as a personal creative practice. Mm. What I didn't know, I didn't know it'd get the, as much sort of print and media attention as it did right out of the box. But now what people are finding inspiring is the simplicity and the, you know, 
I could do that too kind of inspiration. It, you know, it's me on the kitchen floor with white poster board, a hundred dollar tripod and that's it, you know, off to the races. And, and so people are finding also the other thing that people are finding very inspiring about my project. And we'll talk about the dailiness, the power of dailiness, yeah. but that I was able to fit a creative practice into family life. So, you know, my kids are up and out now, but when I started, my son was, he's 20 now, it's been over 12 years. So he was eight, seven and a half, eight years old when I started. Yeah. And my daughter would have been 12. I was able to start this practice that grew and grew and grew into a significant body of work without disrupting the harmony of the family, without having to exile myself to some studio. It, you know, it, it literally became a family practice. I mean, the kids loved the treasure hunt of finding new subjects for mom. And so, People are finding that inspiring too, that you can be an artist. Well, in, you know, in, in this way, what, this is one model of how to be an artist that people, you know, keep with an intention of keeping it simple, but also an intention of it not requiring this isolated artist kind of arrangement. So anyways, both of those are, are people are finding um, inspiring. Lisa Congdon, who, who's, um, oh, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't aware of Lisa's work and I am now because I know that she, she inspired your journey Absolutely. in many respects. I, I love this collection a day. Yeah. Such a simple, simple idea. The beauty of all of this, Lisa's yeah. work, who I know was an inspiration for you and your work, which is now an inspiration for many others. Yeah. It is the utter simplicity of it. Right, right. Um, the other inspiration, Lisa's collection today was absolutely an inspiration. And, and she was an inspiration of sort of putting your work out in the world where people can see it, yeah. you know. But Carl Blasfeld, he's such a big influence on me. Yeah. When you look at his work, you will see, I mean, it's very, very similar. But he was back in the day of Bauhaus. He was part of that. I think he was part of that Bauhaus group in, in Germany. But he started making photos of nature isolated on a white background. Yeah. He was using his educational tools. So he could give to the the carving students and the, you know, the wallpaper, you know, the illustrating students, actual models of nature. Yeah. And so like, you know, for tendrils and leaves and seed pods so that they could use those as templates for carving or illustration. Wait till you see his work. I, I just, and the fact that he did that, you know, he had shutter times of like hours. I saw that work about probably five or 10 years before I started still. Right. And it just, I stopped right. in my tracks. And so he's a big influence as well. I know you feel that this has enhanced your life by the fact that you're now more observational. And um, it's yeah. something that the family, I think you've already really suggested that the family tapped into it. They were out there on the treasure hunt for you as well. Yeah. This, this, yeah. Um, and we often talk about this on the program, actually, this idea of being out there and uh, not looking, but seeing, which is a favorite yes. phrase of a mentor of mine. But and that's been the the joy of finding this, isn't it? The, yeah, the fact that, that means, you, you've become more observational as well. You notice the natural world around you in a way that you didn't prior. No, and this has been the biggest um, surprise of this practice. So I've been making one image a day of found nature every day for 12 years. I mean, it's, cra it's crazy, mm. kind of. But it, it's not, it, you know, because you can ask my my husband or my kids, you know, it ha it's no different than maybe doing meditation every day for 12 years. Yeah, and so yeah. what it became, so I started the practice as a creative practice to teach myself elements of composition. I happened to use a camera to capture it. I shared it with the world. It got a, a lot of attention. And so I, I, at first I kept going after, I devised the project as a one year project, a one a day, pro a one a day for one year. But it got so much attention that I kept going because some of the press that had been produced wasn't going to be published until the following year. And I felt obligated to keep going. But what happened in like the second or third year is, oh, hey, I don't want to stop. This is such a beautiful way of living in the world. It's this what I call heightened attentiveness or, or in order to find a new subject every day. And again, and the other thing that's interesting, instead of going wider for my subjects, I chose to go narrower. So I walk really the same five trails every day around my suburban home. Um, so, you know, these are not sexy. I just got back from California and I gave a workshop there and I was like, oh my God, 
I would need three months to adjust. It is like so much to choose from there. It would be like decision fatigue. <laughs> so I'm in the Midwest. It's winter five months of the year. And yet I still chose to go narrower in my subjects instead of wider. How do you mean narrower? So instead of, you know, after the first year you do, I did, I've photographed all the obvious things in my, in my bioregion, it would be cattails and milkweed seed pods and pine trees and oaks and, you know, that kind of thing, prairie grasses. And then after the, you know, first year, 365 images, second year, 700 and some images, you start to exhaust the obvious stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. So I can keep revisiting those subjects. Or what I think a lot of photographers do is they go wider. They'll go spend a month or a week in the desert or on the California coast or in Florida yeah. and go wider in their search for natural subjects. And I chose, I continued to walk those same five trails and just train myself truly to trick myself or train myself to see beyond the ordinary. I, I call it the infraordinary to see which is below the ordinary. So I, I would give myself these tricks so that I would stop seeing the obvious, which is the fall colors, the sumac leaves in, in a blaze in orange and red. And so I could see past that because the eye wants to stop on that. We're, you know, we're wired to stop on the obvious, those colorful, bright, big, bold things. And I had to train myself to like filter, literally filter that out so I could see past it. So I went deeper into, you know, more esoteric, more mundane, more ordinary, the things your brain don't really register the the le the leaves the decomposing leaves so not looking for perfection not at all not at all matter of fact that that's one lesson for sure is that a perfect flower a, a flower in perfect bloom is kind of interesting yeah. for me it no longer really is i mean maple thorpe made them look sexual and so they're kind of interesting but for me they're far more interesting before they open as you know as they're bursting their casing or after they've peaked when they're starting to die back and that they're they're far far more expressive as subjects in those states than they are as a peak bloom so what happened is this practice turned in into this heightened sense of attentiveness walking the same trails every day for 12 years I had to be present at some point every day, like present, present, right? In the way that you are with mindfulness. But with mindfulness often or meditation, it's an in, you're inward focused. In my case, I'm outward focused on the natural environment, but it's the same benefit. I think there's research now that's saying that's even better than the inward focus of meditation is if you can, if you can then sort of transcend yourself so I'm outwardly focused and have to be present in that kind of hyper attentive way, at least part of every day to find my subject. And I just found that such a thrilling way to live in the world that I didn't want to stop. And my thanks to Mary Jo Hoffman, who will be back soon to talk about the process of publishing a book, The Transformative Power of Dailiness a superpower perhaps for everybody and uh, and also we'll touch on creative writing which is something very close to my my heart at the moment in terms of learning more about it it's something that i want to uh, i want to expand my knowledge about uh, last week we launched india 25 where we're heading to mumbai for a great train adventure we'll be sampling the culture visiting and photographing the urban environments and rural quiet of, uh, of a most extraordinary part of the country. Already, seven people have expressed their interest and if everybody on that list firmly underlines their intentions when the full itinerary comes out, we're closing that list. But uh, if you do want to put your name forward, now's the time, please do. I think uh, you probably only in reality have, um, have the, the next month at the most uh, to do that. And there are only now three places left on the second week of our Scottish retreat where we travel again to Inverness 
to the highlands, uh, within reach of the most beautiful landscapes and towns and cities. The, um, the fifth Photo Walk Retreat celebrates the feeling our podcast brings to this community. It's a, an opportunity in Scotland to escape the noise and spend time with like-minded photographers. People who won't say, come on, we've got the cafe to get to. Would you just stop taking pictures? Come on. No. You take as long as you like. You linger longer, which is one of my favourite phrases, and make those pictures. Take your time. And that's what that week is, is all about. We'll be embracing new creative challenges, including darkroom skills. Now, I've been in the darkroom on the Inverness, the Scottish Highlands retreat now, for um, a, few, a few years. And I have some darkroom experience. But I learn something new every single time because Matt Sillers, who's, um, who's our host and tutor, our mentor for, for that particular day, he's just the most brilliant teacher. He really is. So I'm looking forward to that. We'll also be doing creative learning about creative writing um, with Merrin Glover, who is a professional writer. And, uh, and we'll be learning how to make uh, sound a part of your stills photography. Enjoying a break away as we encourage and talk with and eat with and laugh with and, of course, walk with each other. The links for both Scotland and India are on the show page. And there's only three places left now for Scotland. Right. I'm still looking for this ivy on the floor. <laughs> as I've been walking along. I'm not going to snip anything. I think it might have to be a, a composition about wood. There's plenty, of, um, there's plenty of wood, plenty of twigs, plenty of bits of branches that have snapped off. There was one I found just a moment ago that's... Uh, <laughs> it will be a bit of a project to lug back to the car. So I'm going small. I'm going small. Right, a letter from Mike Lovett, who right now will be picking himself off the slightly muddy path since we've had more rain of late, because this was sent back in August when it was uh, not quite so rainy and when the tree in the picture we're about to talk about was full of leafy life. I do say I get to all your letters sooner or later. It's all a bit random, I know. There are some read soon after they arrive, others mature like a fine wine. The sort of wine that has a sommelier bring it over, who then explains every last note of taste that you should be able to savour. I'm never quite sure what to do at those moments. Um, I usually just smile awkwardly and ask them if they have a cheaper house alternative. <laughs> anyway, Mike, to your letter from August. Hello, Neil. This is my first time sending a letter to the show. First, I'd like to say what a wonderful contribution uh, you're making to the photography community. Nurse, bring the screens. I'm blushing. Um, I look forward to listening to the photo walk in the extra mile each week. I've been um, photographing off and on for about 10 years with varying levels of commitment. However, for the past several months, it seems that I've been fully bitten by the photography bug and I've been taking my photography much more seriously than I ever did in the past. My equipment may not be the best, but I'm getting by. I'm eyeing some upgrades on mpb.com. I am glad to hear it and plan to upgrade my camera body soon. I enjoyed hearing Mally Davis uh, share his infectious enthusiasm for photographing trees. His passion comes right through the speakers in the way he expresses his feelings for those majestic characters. It inspired me to hear Mally talk about lone trees and I remembered seeing one lone tree in particular located about 45 minutes away from where I live. So I recently travelled to that location to photograph the tree. I was thrilled when I arrived to find that I had the entire park to myself. There was even a foreboding sky to boot. I photographed this tree and a few others that were scattered along the trail, which meanders through a mountain top meadow. Sounds marvellous. A beautiful day and a wonderful outing with my camera, all thanks to the inspiration brought directly to my ears through the show. Thank you so much for the effort you put into producing this show and building a wonderful community. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, cheers from Mike Lovett. P.S. The attached photo was taken at Dalton Park. Uh, which is located along the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, USA land. The, um, the picture, Mike, is on the show page, and those clouds behind it, that, oh, that is what I call character. Um, that is not a bleh sky in any way, shape, and form, is it? The tree's fascinating as well. It's leaning right slightly, like it's just gently 
Well, you, you use the word meandering like it's gently meandering across the ground. Maybe, uh, maybe walking to an extent. Neil, have you been on the mushrooms again? No. But, uh, but there's this offshoot, a branch that's shooting out to the left as if it's trying to pull the tree back. Come this way. Uh, you'll see it on the show page. Um, it's a fabulous picture. Thank you, Mike, for it. And uh, there's a lot to see on the show page today. Pictures and videos. So do make sure you go to photowalk.show, look up the episode for today, and go visit the uh, go visit the pictures that you find there with the links. And there's a few rabbit holes to follow. <laughs> it's uh, definitely a couple of coffees and a few Garibaldis, this one. It's the photo walk show. Just you, just me, with our cameras. Me with my box to collect stuff in today to make some still life pictures with when I get back to studio. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere near those. They, uh, the nettles, the nettles are growing along here. This is, I meant to say this earlier, this path that I walk, it's, um, it's definitely a winter path because now the nettles are beginning to sprout and later on, not so much later on in the year, maybe a month or two at most, most of this path I won't be able to get through because the nettles just, they, they reach across it and uh, they, they take over the place. It becomes somewhere that you just don't venture this path. Certainly Sir Barkalot, who's not with me today, He'll, uh, he'll be on the, uh, the extra mile this week. Certainly, Sir Barkalot, there's no way I'll get him along here. He'd be, what have you brought me along? Uh, what's this path? Can't see, and I'll get my nose stung. Thanks very much. So, yes, it's the photo walk. If you'd like to write in, then uh, please do. Send your emails to stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show. Like Mike Lovett did just a moment ago. And if you're sending in pictures, like Mike did, then send them. If you can, resize them to 2,500 pixels wide. That's fantastic. If you can't, send me the full resolution and I will do the heavy lifting. Um, please don't put borders and things around. And if you can uh, not watermark them, that looks better on the show page itself. I know we need to protect your artistry. I know that. That's important. That's why I'll make sure I pop up any links that you uh, include within your, uh, your letters, your emails that you send to me. The, uh, the philosophical YouTuber, Sean Tucker, is joining us each month to answer your questions. Um, if you would like to send a question to Sean, the same email applies, stories at photowalk.show, and I'll be sure to... Um, put the questions you send me to Sean during this feature. So if you'd like to reach out to him, have a listen to this. It might inspire you. And then be sure to contact me. Sean, it will probably help if I read the letter first, won't it? And, yep. uh, and then you can answer. I studied poetry in college. This is from Mike Newhurst. I have a fascination too with photography since well before any thought was given to the word career. Writing and photography, these things haunt me and murmur to me daily. My rebellious act of college was to study writing and poetry rather than pursue the engineering degree my parents thought I needed for a good job. Oh, that sounds a familiar story. But leaving college, a certain panic grabbed hold of me and I latched onto the tech industry as a way to survive while I pursued these other creative interests. Now, more than 25 years on, I have had a decent amount of success in IT and still have made no meaningful progress on the creative pursuits I purport to love and feel I need. I need the enrichment and excitement writing and photography bring my life and brain. But even on trips, I struggle to get moving, writing and photographing, despite new cultures and locations setting my mind ablaze. The pattern, more pronounced, post those years we won't name, is that the work I do needs the creativity I have. And by the time the work is done, my resources are spent. I've got energy to make dinner and sink into a couch. So what advice would you give to somebody whose daily work and their creative pursuits seem to sap the same set of resources and uh, compete utterly for space. I bet there's a lot of people that feel like that. Yeah, I mean, I felt like that before. I, I was, uh, when I was working in London, I was a product photographer for years, which e even though you get to make money with a camera in hand doing that, it's not very creative. Anyone who's done it will know. It's, um, it's a case of 
you know, plowing through, you know, 50, 60, 70 products in a day and just keeping it consistent. It's not, it's not very exciting work. It felt a bit like science. It felt technical. It didn't feel like creativity. Yeah. Uh, and I realized very similar that I, I was, I was not fulfilling myself creatively. You know, I could tell people I'm a photographer, but I, 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 it didn't mean that I was creatively fulfilled. And so I had to start building time on the side of the day job to do something that was pure creativity. So I initially, this is how I started street photography. I went out with my phone mm -hmm. and I would, I would get off uh, at an earlier station and have a half hour walk home instead of five minutes. Ah. And I challenged myself to photograph whatever I saw on that walk, uh, just reacting to whatever was out there and trying to get at least one image a day that I took that I kind of liked for some reason and then share it with the world. It, it was in my daily schedule. I wasn't really adding that much to my life and I made it part of my commute as a way to find a little spot in my day where I could do something that was purely creative again. Did it work? Yeah. I mean, it, it started a whole new genre of photography for me. I wasn't a street photographer at all. I never even thought about it. And my camera, by the way, for those stayed in my bag because I had this, I had mixed feelings about these big 5D Mark IIs and four lenses that I used for product photography. I was falling out of love with my cameras because yeah. they were so technical. And just the act of going out and not thinking too much about settings or anything else, you couldn't, it was a phone. And just just shooting in a purely instinctive way mm. sort of brought it back to me, which was really good. But I think I'd say, you know, if you're sitting there and you're saying, I mean, on the one hand, you've got the energy problem, right? And that's a work-life yeah. balance problem. If, if you have no time or energy, but the job that you're doing, there's something to address there. And, and I know that's easy to say, some people have very, very busy jobs and they, they feel like they don't have a choice. And that might be true. It might not be true. But I think there's something that needs to get looked at in terms of if you have no time at all for the things that you love, something needs to change in your life because that's not a, a sustainable way to live. But then the other is the motivation thing, I think. It's if you don't want to or you don't feel motivated to get up and make the thing that you love to make that you say gives you so much back what is wrong there? What's the complicated relationship with this thing that you say you love so much? I, I talk to so many photographers who say, you know, I just, I absolutely love photography. I desperately want to make photographs. I want to be a photographer, but I just struggle with the motivation to pick up the camera. Mm. Now on paper, those two things can't exist. I really love doing a thing that I can't get up the energy to do. There's something wrong. There's a disconnect. So, and I don't, I, I couldn't know from the outside what that is. You have to work that out for yourself. You have to sit and go, what's what's in the way here? Is it self-confidence, a belief in myself? Is it I, I can't control the outcome or the results of the work that I make and that frustrates me? Is there fear involved? What is at the root of, I absolutely love this thing, but I can't drum up the motivation to actually build some time in my life to do it. There's something deeper going on there. Maybe it's also a case of, you're looking at this thing that you want to do and thinking of all the projects you're going to do and the places it's going to take you and the adventures you're going to have. And you think, but I just can't bring myself to press the start button because that seems like a huge hill to climb where you're loading on so much pressure that what you want to do has got to be this incredible project. And you don't start from the small start like you did when you were you know, simply getting off the train a couple of stops earlier and forcing yourself to walk more which gave you an opportunity to do something as simple as making a photograph yeah and i think when it comes to the big projects where you, you say to yourself i want to start something and i'm on day one and this just feels like a mammoth yeah. mountain to climb i think this is going to sound harsh i think we need to like we need to start replacing feelings with a bit of discipline again i think we've sort of slid into this world where we only make when we feel like it and we tie we tie inspiration to feeling we say stuff like you know i i i, I don't feel inspired i don't think inspiration is a feeling that's why we can have quotes like inspiration will find you working because sometimes you have to start working mm -hmm to feel inspired. I've made some of my best images on days where I did not want to get off the sofa. And I was going to say, is, are there days like that for you where you think, Absolutely. Oh, I can't be bothered with this today? I'm, I'm, yeah, and, and but you've dragged yourself kicking and screaming out with a camera. I have I have these little books which I put out for years called Collections, right. and, and it's 90 images from any given year, and they act as time capsules to those years now. And when I flick through them, <laughs> there are so many images in those books that I know wouldn't have existed if I only made work on days I felt like it. Right. And that would be sad. There's so much good work that wouldn't exist. But I, I put myself in the headspace where I, I remind myself 
deliberately, this is the thing you love. Today, you might feel a bit flat about it or unsure about it, but you do love it. I know that. That's a fact. So I'm going to get up and choose to start making, even if I don't feel like it, and trust that some of the time, not every time, some of the time, I'm going to really get into it and enjoy it. And inspiration will find me working and a ton of work will now exist that was made on a day I chose against that feeling. Does that also work for, because I know how much work making a film takes and I look at your work and I know there must be some people that look at it and they think, well, there we go. There's Sean's nice opening sequence. We've got the trickle of the, the, the stream coming in. Up comes the quote, lovely, I love all the, that bit that's, of cello. yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but that stuff uh, it it takes it takes time to do, and I I know that I procrastinate over films because sometimes I think oh god there seems to be so much to do here, I, and I feel the same every time I make a video, do you? every single time. I mean I I have to tell myself on the day that I need to start filming. I have to remind myself what it feels like when it's done. Yeah, there's a long road to to get to get there, but. I, I know enough now. I've done it often enough that I know it feels terrible on day one. Mm. It feels great on the day you post it. And there's the road in between is a mixture of frustrating and exciting. That's all part of the process. They're all good human emotions, right? Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. that we should experience on a journey like that of making something that matters to us, that costs us time and energy. That's how it should be. But I I know that the outcome, even if it didn't work out exactly the way that I wanted it to, which is usually the case, by the way. I will be very happy that I made it. I can't believe it's not the case that your films don't turn out the way that you thought they would. <laughs> I, I don't believe I, that at all. <laughs> I have this weird thing with that where I where I, I will make something and then I'll post it and immediately watching it back, I will be disappointed. Right. Um, I'll be happy that I finished it and happy I made it. That's still all true. But I'll be disappointed because I can see the ways in which it isn't the film that I imagined it would be at the start because I, I get too specific about the ideas that I want to have. And most of those won't work out and I'll have to adapt and compromise. That's true yeah. all the time. But then a weird thing happens whenever I watch those videos back, if I ever decide to watch something back a couple of years later, I will just take it for what it is and I'll love it way more than I did at the time where I'm comparing it to what I had in my mind. And I've learned that too. Let it be what it is because you, down the road, you won't have that initial comparison in your head anymore and it will be much better than you initially you know, it's that whole perfectionist battle. It'd be much better than you were trying to bully yourself to make it. What was what was that phrase? I think I learned it off a McKinnon film, actually. Done is better than... Uh, oh, what was it? It's not done is better than perfect. It was done something is like, better than perfect. Yeah, it is. Like and it's Sheryl Sandberg's quote. Right. Yeah. He, he's, he's taken it from Sheryl you mean Sandberg. Ma- you mean McKinnon didn't make that one up? <laughs> no, well, I mean, he's, I'm sure he said some very wise things in his years, but that wasn't that wasn't his, yeah. So, so what is the... the just, just finally then, and... and Perhaps this will help, Mike. Is there a is there a mantra that you have that you you tell yourself on those days where it where it is cold, it's raining, you don't want to go out, you don't want to make a film. There's got to be other things to do. How we can even, I don't know, shine the silver in the house um, in, instead of getting out to make a film. What is there a mantra? Is there something you tell yourself? One more step. That's that's every time. That's what I say. Is is like just do the next thing. Mm. It's not, put the project aside. You know the moves you need to make at this point. Don't think of the whole project. Just take one more step. Do the very next thing. Take the next shot. Go outside and take the next little section of B-roll. Come back, have a cup of tea, sit down, be kind to yourself. Think about it again. Give yourself a little break if you need it. And then decide what you want to do next, what you want to do next. I find a lot of the anxiety and the pressure we put on ourselves is because we're trying to put the whole project at once into our head. And we're trying to find the energy for all of it at once instead of just the next little thing you have to do. It's a little bit of compartmentalizing and, and just one more step. So to ask Sean a question that he can personally answer for you, then stories at photowalk.show is the email address. I love coming out early in the morning. There's definitely a different smell to being in the countryside in the morning, isn't there? Definitely. Look, we've got some bluebells coming out as well. That season's not so far away. All right, a short letter prior to the second part of my conversation with Mary Jo Hoffman. And this one is from Per Berghaug, who's uh, in one of the most beautiful places on this planet, Filjafell. Filjafell, I do try... <laughs> my best to sound as Norwegian pair as I can for you. I'm not sure I 
I'm not sure I I fit the bill very well. Uh, but I tell you what, I'll link to the place in the show notes today, and you can learn about the the history of this place. Greetings, Neil. I thought it might be time to make a small contribution again. To be honest, I thought about it for a while, says Pear, but listening to the show, I found it hard to come up with something of interest to write about. There are so many clever people contributing, making me think I haven't anything that's interesting to write about. A bit of imposter syndrome, on my part, perhaps. But then I thought I would just write and say how much I appreciate the show and the efforts you're making. I truly do. Uh, well... I, I'm having to hide behind the sofa a lot today. I tell you what, it's it's hard work dragging this thing. No wonder I've got tennis elbow. Every week I, I look forward to the new episode. I almost missed the time when I was catching up with the episodes that I hadn't listened to. Now I have to wait a whole week for a new one. And uh, there's so much to appreciate, ranging from all your interesting guests and what they can share, to you just talking and walking. In fact... I think perhaps I enjoy that bit the most. So thank you again. Much appreciated. More as an afterthought, I enclose... So you did send a picture. I enclose a photograph from my photo ski hike yesterday. A sort of skike, I suppose. Would that be a skike? A ski ski hike? It's Easter week, and my better half and I have already spent a few days at our cabin here in Filiafell before the rest of the family moves in later on today. (laughs) The peace and quiet will be shattered. Yesterday, I decided to do a rather long-haul ski hike around 23 kilometres across the mountains. Blimey! I tell you what, those who ski hike, and you'll know this pair, you lot must have thighs that could crush walnuts. (laughs) It's the most incredible way, I would imagine, to keep fit. It really is. I have trouble just going down the hills. I can't imagine going up them, especially the steep ones. I've seen you lot. You do. Red run going down, no problem. Somebody's coming up faster the other way. What? How are they doing that? The uh, the day started out quite decent, says Pear, but once up in the mountains, it turned, if not bad, at least more wintry. Lots of snow and rather low visibility. Fortunately, not too much wind. I, of course, had my camera along and did make a few pictures. The one enclosed is of another skier I passed. Just getting a glimpse of him or her at a distance in the snow made for a rather minimalistic picture. And I think it gives a good impression of what the conditions were like. (laughs) And I think we know what the conditions were like by the fact you didn't know who it was. I, I'm sure they were balaclavered to the max um, because oh, it can be biting, can't it? This, by the way, this, this, underline this, put it in bold, actually. This is one of the most extraordinary pictures in terms of its minimalism I've seen from Norway ever. And I really, really do mean that. It's just incredible. It's a, well, you look at it, you'll see it on the show page today, and you'll think, oh, oh, yes, oh, there's a person. Our head of IT looked at it, Mr. Ford, and uh, initially he rubbed his screen because he thought he had a mark on it. Um, It's on the show page. It is a whiteout with this teeny, tiny, teeny figure absolutely enveloped by this snow scene. I'm telling you, this should be in a gallery. It really should. Spare your blushes. I mean it. It's got a, I think it's got a, Come on, Neil, don't go over the top. I'm going to, stand by. I think it's got a spiritual edge to it. And um, I have put it on the show page without a border because it needs to float. It really does. Which is a fabulous way also to reintroduce you to Mary Jo Hoffman, who talked of just that, didn't she? These wonderful, mindful, spiritual pictures of nature floating on the screen or the paper. Here's Mary Jo, our conversation, part two. My uh, my previous guest to you today was Sean Tucker, who takes um, a really deeper dive into the psychology of of the why and how we we create. And Mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit today about procrastination with with Sean, finding that mental wherewithal to start projects because, you know, you're, you're too tired from the daily grind. You've managed to transcend that. I'm interested in this idea of a daily ritual because I dare say you do have moments 
where making your work isn't at the top of your list mentally? Or, oh, or are you about absolutely. to say, no, I, you know, every where well, you did, you said it's like a meditation. But I know, it's like I know that having been somebody who's gone through doing meditation now and then, yes, you don't always feel like it. Right. No, you don't. So um, I committed to one a day and then. It's so I call it the transformative power of dailiness. It's one of the essays in my book. And I really truly feel like this is like a sneaky superpower that anyone can do is commit to doing something daily. I call it radical incrementalism. So it's something small. Again, it, you know, I couldn't have done this for 12 years if in its simplest, I couldn't check that day off in, you know, in a matter of minutes, in its simplest. And there are days I take hours or better part of a day to make a composition. But in its simplest, I can do this in minutes. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, yeah. um, he there's, he has a famous quote where a young comedian saw him in a green room before after a show and said, Jerry, what's the secret to being a comedian? And he said... I'll tell you what the secret is. You get yourself one of those giant wall calendars. You put it on the wall and every day you write down one joke. And when you write down one joke, you make an X on the calendar and you never break the chain. And he didn't say make a good joke. He just said, you just write down one funny thing every day and you put an X on the calendar and you never break the chain. And essentially, that's what I've done. The reason I love Don't Break the Chain is the visual of it. But what I soon learned was the process was more sacred than the results. The fact that there were products, that there were photos at the end of the day, almost didn't matter. And so what that means and why that works for perfectionism and procrastination is that the the most important thing is not breaking the chain. So you cannot break the chain by making an uninteresting photo. So I have when I give workshops, I show pictures where I, you know I had minutes before the sun was setting to make a photo, and I ran into the yard and grabbed a handful of grass and arranged it in a circle, and that was good enough yeah. to not break the chain. Yeah. So I'm you know I'm 12 years in. I have over 4,000 images in my portfolio now probably 400 of them I would say I'm proud of but 400 is a big portfolio yeah. right yeah yeah and yeah. it's not a bad portfolio and 275 of them are in the book that's coming out you know so what it does is it lowers the sta- the dailiness lowers the stakes it and because of the deadline you can't procrastinate the ch- you know not breaking the chain is more sacred than the result so the image doesn't have to be perfect. What has to be perfect is not breaking the chain. Yeah. Where does your writing fit into all this? Because that that can be something that takes a you know reasonable amount of consideration. Your husband will know this. He's a writer. I never aspired to be a writer, but I live with one. And so what um, I have six essays in the book because I have a very talented writer in the house. I got to um, kind of free write my thoughts around different topics and then i'm actually good at structuring my thoughts i'm just not facile with sentences and words the way a writer is so i got to sort of free write my thoughts Mm. and then uh, my husband i I had the one of the best editors in the country i'll say that but but, but, (laughs) but, i mean there's humor there's there's emotionally mooted pieces I, i think something that's important here and perhaps you're not crediting yourself enough here is that uh, when you when you read the work of writers, for instance, novelists, you never really get a feel of who they are. Um, you get a feel of who their characters are. You never really meet them. Um, mm-hmm. But with the writing that you're doing, that is about meeting you, isn't it? And I think that's what creative writing for many photographers can be about and is for. Well, thank you. I, 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 I'm glad you felt that through, you know, I am, I am a sharer. So these were, you know, kind of well-formulated ideas by the time I was asked to sit down and write them. So the publisher let me turn in whatever I wanted to, because it was going to be a photo book mostly, but this is just what came out. I, I, it is interesting because I'm now giving a lot of workshops and talks and a book is such a snapshot in time. I mean, my ideas, they, that book helped me formulate my ideas but my ideas have evolved. They haven't changed. They've evolved. They've matured. They've gotten more nuanced. Mm. I, I would say deeper since I wrote those essays for the book. 
And so that's kind of interesting because the book is just becomes just a snapshot in time. Tell me about a nothing. What's a nothing? It, it's a strategy for living that uh, that I think one of these fireside chats that you've had with your uh, yeah. with your husband, the, the, because I know this is a, a partnership thing. This, uh, yeah, what, I love what, that you're. I love that you're asking this because when we, my my husband and I were so we've been married, I don't know, thirty four years, and when we were um, young, in our we got married young, hmm. too too young maybe, <laughs> but when we were young, we read this book people will laugh. It was, it was popular back then. It was uh, your money or your life. Right. And in that book, they talk about enoughing, which is, you know, earn enough money to, you know, cover your needs and then stop focusing on earning money and follow your passion or your calling or make a difference in the world or whatever. So they called it enoughing. And they actually, the book teaches you like how to find how much money is enough for you. Mm. My husband and I, who both had were working sort of conventional jobs, but were had creative ambitions. It was a compelling idea, you know. Be busy squirrels and bury your nuts. You know, live below your means for a while, and then get enough money in the bank so that you can pursue your creative hobbies, which is kind of what we did. But we've a sense applied it to like I think it can apply to a lot of things. Like I was talking earlier about just enough equipment and no more. Yeah. Like, you know, it, once you have too much equipment, you're spending time managing, wrestling with your equipment. And so finding that in that point of for your project, for your style of photography, what is enough? And then stop there. Don't keep going on the equipment. Let's talk about the book. It comes out in May. Uh, uh-huh. You've already alluded to the process of getting back into a team to produce it after uh-huh. 12 years uh, from from that very first yeah. moment where you where you laid something on a, a white sheet of whatever um, mm-hmm. and made a photograph here we are it's the it's right. it's the classic 12 year you know overnight success overnight right? success yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But, but behind but, every overnight success is it. 10 years of hard work Absolutely. that's right here's the book at last so tell me about the book and and what you hoped um, to achieve with it and how it's turned out okay so a book agent approached me in Instagram in DMs said have you ever thought about a book I wrote back to her I was like first of all I don't want to do a gift book I don't I, I want it to be a real art book a substantial art book and I don't want to and I don't have an idea for a structure like it's I'm doing nature photography I don't want to do a lazier cliched see you know four seasons yeah. spring summer yeah. winter fall yeah. I thought about by color an unfolding as you went through it by color but that put things that were in the wrong seasons next to each other and that didn't work for me and so i could just couldn't come up with a structure where every time you turn the two page spread the two images complemented each other and belonged together in my mind but what happened so i put her off for two years and then finally um during covid like so many of us had time to play um my daughter who's a graphic designer was home and i said i came up with this i stumbled on this idea of 72 micro seasons this old japanese calendar and i was reading a book by kenya hara and he made a one paragraph reference to it and it just lit me up because it was the same thing I was learning by doing 12 years of daily walks to find a subject to photograph. And so I dug into 72 micro seasons and I thought, oh, finally, I have a, I think I have a structure for a book that I could be proud of. So my daughter is home, COVID. I said, help me mock this up really quick. I'll, you, you know, dueling laptops, I'll throw images at you uh over airdrop and you put them into a, a book template and sure enough and it took two days and what came out was like ah i'm proud of this like i could be proud of this yeah. so then i said to the agent yeah let's go and i gave her my mocked up book and she re- approached monicelli who's an imprint of fiden and they were acquired by fiden probably four four or five years ago so they said yeah they said yes and um it was just an utter delight to work with them. And they honestly have elevated. It's, a, I think, 320 pages, glossy, heavyweight paper. It's just absolutely stunning. I ask at the end of all my 
conversations. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something I actually, in much the same fashion that perhaps you didn't set out to make a daily photograph and it just, it happened. And um, this is a question that has happened to me and I've asked it of so many people. And I think you will um, provide a really interesting answer to this because you've changed your life you've you've become mindful you've become you've become more observational you've your family has changed your routine has everything about you has changed mm -hmm. and much of that is down to photography and art um what's your why mm, that's a super good question i love that question I've never been asked this. I don't think I've, I've only told one person this, well, to my husband and my best friend. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why. When I was in college, I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called Sjogren's. It's in the lupus family. And for a few years in my 30s, I lupus causes dryness, dry eyes, dry mouth, dry skin, and or Sjogren's. It was so bad, I was physically uncomfortable a lot of the time. It's under control now, so that's great. I'm, I'm fine now. But in, the, in my 30s, my mid-30s, I, I was physically uncomfortable because of dry skin. You know, just itchy, uncomfortable all the time. And I could do, I found, I could do creative work, and we now call it flow, right? I could get into flow, and I could be out of my own body for a couple hours and I would forget how uncomfortable I was. So that's why I, I say I had ambitions to be a visual artist. I, if I was, I do collage, I do visual journaling. If I was in making mode, I could lose myself physically for a couple hours. So creativity for me led to flow, which I think leads to the sacred. Uh, it, it's an on, I call it an on-ramp. For me, creativity is an on-ramp to the sacred. A lot of things get people to the sacred, right? Prayer works, uh, exercise for some people, music for a lot of people. For me, because of my circumstances, it was creativity. So my why is it's an on-ramp to the sacred. Beautiful. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> Probably not what you're expecting. <laughs> Blue skies shining at me, nothing but blue skies. Look at this, everyone, would you? I can't see out the other side of it, Neil. You'll have to explain it. What do you mean? Of course you can see. Just use your imagination. Look upwards. Look at that. I've been walking in so many blue skies, not shining at me of late, that I'd forgotten that it was blue, the sky. <laughs> My thanks to Mary Jo Hoffman. What an absolute delight and privilege to talk with Mary Jo. It really was. Ah. If you can't wait until next Friday, though, to walk a bit more and talk together, then the Extra Mile edition number 426 is waiting for you. The Extra Mile, Neil? What is the Extra Mile? I've no idea what you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you. If you've not been around these parts too long and you're thinking, what's this extra mile that they talk about, the extra milers that they talk about or I talk about? Well, it's our wonderful community of supporters, our walkers, our photographers who help to keep this podcast here with um, a modest, generous donation that they can or you can make monthly or these days annually and i'm very thankful for it because it helps keep the podcast here i know people sometimes think oh i haven't got time to listen to another show um the show is there because i want to do something of value for you and i really do think the the show's <laughs> Well, they are a show of themselves, that's for sure. But it's not just about listening to the... It's not just about listening to those extra miles. We have a Zoom meet-up once a month, but also it's just a way to... I say just a way. It's the way, a way, the way, to support the, the podcast alongside our wonderful sponsors, MPB. Because without you... Well, it wouldn't be here because it takes a lot of time to do this podcast. I know it's a personal choice. I see you looking over your, over your glasses, over your specs at me right now. But uh, it's become something that, um, well, I really enjoy. And I think from the letters we get, our community, we all enjoy being in this community together. 
Now, talking of extra milers, an extra miler is, uh, well, he's the star of the show this week, as I, I like you to be the stars of these extra shows that we have. Jim Pearson is my guest. He tells the story of, well, as a photographer, being run down by a Boeing 747. On this week's Extra Mile. It was a beautiful shot. Yeah. So I put that lens on and I knelt down on one side on my knee with my camera bag over the shoulder and I was just shooting away. And next thing I knew, I was being run over by one of the wheels on the 747. Also this week, I have perhaps an apology to make for an experiment in voice AI that we tried last week on the Extra Mile show that didn't please everybody. Cryptic, I know, all will be revealed. Our PS on the show is to come, but before that, we need a playout song. A song just to make some final frames to, and I'm going to collect some more bits and bobs from the, uh, from the floor of the path here, uh, because I, I've stuck with wood as a theme. I couldn't find any ivy in the end. It was, as I suggested, clinging to the trees. It's environment saying, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you very much. Don't be taking me back to your studio. So I've gone for, well, I've gone for wood. I've gone for twigs. I'm, I'm hoping I might be able to make some sort of interesting shape out of them, inspired by uh, what I've seen of Mary Jo's work. We shall see or you shall see. I suspect instead of, I don't know, six or eight or four sometimes, depending upon how many photographs I, I make on the photo walk, I, I'll probably end up with... Uh, I'll probably end up with just the one. I'll work hard on on just the one. But there's plenty of stuff to to pick up, so I should have something. So, uh, yes, our PS to the show is to come. Uh, But before that, we need a playout song just to make some final frames too. And uh, I think about perhaps what's been said today, the letters that we've received. I'm truly inspired indeed by everything that's that's been said today and um, and Hannah Gimblet in particular with your letter at the start and the the art that that you're producing the song today is from Fio Mourinho a Portuguese artist so this is I suppose it's world music isn't it in terms of genre and I've chosen it because it well it kind of works with this idea of collecting I think if you squint <laughs> being out in nature collecting the gifts that you find along the way to make pictures and art with. I think it works in terms of its the lightness of uh, the feeling of the song. The song is called Sopro de Mar and it translates to the breath of the sea. I like this. It's a tad meditational, I think, as well. I'm thinking of Mary Jo out there by the lake, quietly in her thoughts, collecting and making photographs when she returns to her house. I'll have a postscript for you in a moment's time. Lá vem o sol, o pai da manhã. Lá vem o sol, o pai da manhã. Yeah. 
sol O pai da manhã That's our play out song for today. Fia Mourinho, I will of course have a link on the show page to the music used and uh, our fantastic cinematic pieces often that you hear between the, uh, uh, the, the conversations and the letters that you sent in or send in um, are uh, from Artlist, artlist.io, which is a fabulous resource if you are making films, if you're making, I don't know, uh, Instagram uh, pieces, Instagram uh, shorts, YouTube shorts, whatever. I mean, if it needs music, then I think Artlist is a fantastic platform. Anyway, just a few closing thoughts before the PS. My sincere thanks to you if you're about to become an extra miler or if you're already one. My promise to you is to keep building this wonderful community of kindness in the photographic and walking world, a safe place to share our thoughts about this, this thing that we love doing. Now, if you could help me, please, I'd be very grateful. That's twice you've asked for help today, Neil. Oh, I know. Is there a budget? On the, on the show page... There are some handy buttons that help you share the show. They're underneath the player. But also be sure to press that follow or subscribe button on your podcast app so that I can be uh, sure to let you know when there's a new episode out. And if you know somebody who might like to walk with us, please let them know with a message or indeed through the share buttons that I've just mentioned. My, uh, my thanks to Neil Ford, who looks after IT, Andrea Gilpin, who's across Instagram, and Kelly Mitchell, who uh, well, looks after our Facebook members. And uh, you'll need a postscript for the show. Now, today, it's from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who led the transcendentalist movement of the mid-19th century. He was seen as a champion of individualism and critical thinking, a poet, a philosopher. And uh, so I think we can call on Waldo, as he was known, for a PS about nature, as that fits today's show beautifully. And I have this. Adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.